Northwest totem poles. The most outstanding examples of the Northwest Coast woodworker's art are totem poles, which are often carved from a single red cedar trunk. Though they were probably not common before about 1830, oral traditions and storytelling indicate that they certainly existed in smaller numbers before 1830. The first mention of them by a European observer is thought to be that of John Bartlett, who visited a Haida village in the Queen Charlotte Islands in 1791. To the people of the Northwest Coast, the poles were not totem poles. This term, totem, comes from the word ototoman, a word in the Ojibwa language of the Algonquian language family. It's a reference to symbolic animals. The word ototoman was, in turn, borrowed and changed by 19th century anthropologists as totem meaning a specific animal which is associated with a specific clan or family group. That clan or family group, in turn, believes themselves descended from this totem animal. Hunters from the group will therefore not kill one. The term totem pole consequently was defined as a pole with totem animals carved on it. The Haida word for the poles was gya ang, meaning simply a man who stands upright. This is the straightforward literal description as explained by a Haida carver to the American anthropologist Viola E. Garfield. The actual meaning of these images has its beginning in storytelling rather than religion. As pointed out by Robin K. Wright, curator of Ameri Native American art at the University of Washington's Burt Museum, the figures carved on Northwest Coast poles generally represent ancestors or family members, and supernatural beings that were once encountered by those family members, and thereby they have, that gives them the right to represent themselves as crests or symbols of their identity and records of their history. So these totem poles tell stories about the family and when the family, a member of the family has had an, an interaction of some kind with some kind of fantastic being. It's believed that the earliest totem poles were part of the inside of the house posts. Later, they developed into outside corners for the family houses and those flanking the front or the entrance of the house. Similar poles were carved to hold the ashes of cremated family members or as a grave marker. Traditionally, carving was done by a group of craftsmen who had been formally trained in an apprenticeship system. The desired size, the symbols, and the story were related in full detail prior before the work began, and the pole was carved according to these specifics. The size of the totem poles was controlled only by the length of cedar logs from which they were carved, and they frequently reached a height in excess or more than 50 feet. By the late 19th century, just as the totem pole renaissance or the golden age of totem poles was in full swing, the craft was brought to a halt by Canadian laws which outlawed many traditional ceremonies and expressions. The principal aim of these laws was to eliminate the potlatch, which was a feast or party where the host proved his wealth by basically giving it away to his guests to gain prestige. As with many modern equivalents, such as weddings and bar mitzvahs, the lavishness of the potlatch was proportional with the value of the prominence that one wanted to gain. Considered wasteful and unproductive by the Canadian government, not to mention the difficulty of taxing such transfers of property, the potlatch was banned from 1885 to 1951. Even then, the law was merely deleted from the legal code, not actually repealed. But because totem poles had been part of the extravagance associated with the potlatch, the raising of new ones had terminated in Canada. And it had stopped. They weren't making any new ones in Canada during that time. After the potlatch ban was lifted in 1951, Canada made a complete reversal of public policy. They encouraged that which had been forbidden before. The government proceeded to commission artists such as Mungo Martin to create new totem poles for public display, with traditional potlatch ceremonies often being a part of the formal dedication. 